a routine landing. Ladies and gentlemen, we are starting our approach to the Very good Turns into a sudden fight to the death. You're gonna lose it all of a sudden. There it is. A passenger jet mysteriously falls from the sky and rockets towards a busy highway. Push it up. Push it way up. Ah. Delta, go around. Ah. Hey, it's gonna crash! A mysterious force brings down a plane claiming 137 lives. In the wreckage lies the one clue that can stop it from killing again. August the 2nd, 1985, Dallas, Texas. It's a very hot day, even by Texas standards. See you all tomorrow. Temperatures soar to 101 degrees. The rain coming. Should cool things down a bit. In the late afternoon, William Maybury is heading home from work. The day's heat and humidity are having an effect on traffic at Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, DFW. Roughly the size of Manhattan, DFW is the biggest airport in the world. It's also one of the busiest. The heat has triggered some afternoon thunderstorms at the airport, creating a backlog of planes waiting to take off. American 631, you are cleared for takeoff. Air traffic controller Gene Skipworth is in the tower today. He's been working there for 14 years. With him is controller Mike Porter. Uh, Skipworth was not asking for help. Nothing seemed unusual other than the fact that we were starting to get busy and aircraft were starting to pile up. One of the many planes heading towards Skipworth's control is Delta Airlines Flight 191. Weather 6,000 scattered, 1,000 scattered, visibility 10, temperature 101. 101? 101. 101 degrees, yes sir. Captain Ed Connors and First Officer Rudy Price are two of Delta Airlines' most experienced pilots. Second Officer Nick Nasik is the other member of today's crew. The crew is flying a six-year-old L-1011 TriStar. The L-1011 is billed as one of the safest planes in the sky. There are 152 passengers and 11 crew members on board. They're scheduled to land in Dallas just before six in the evening. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. Hope you're enjoying your flight so far. Traffic is backing up at Dallas. All told, we'll be about 10 to 15 minutes late getting to the gate. Please let us know if there's anything we can do to make your flight more comfortable. The delay bothers Chris Meyer. He's a frequent business traveler who's in a hurry to get home to his family for the weekend. I've been down in Florida, Fort Lauderdale, for the last two weeks. And it was a Friday afternoon, and I was due to go home on Flight 191. One of IBM's best-known executives is also on the flight. Don Estridge led the development of the IBM PC. He and his wife are traveling to Dallas for a family visit. Nine six three, turn right, heading six two zero. 
En route from Florida to Texas, Delta 191 will be in communication with several controllers. Turn you into Blue Ridge, it'll be about zero. Every aircraft is guided along its flight path by a series of regional air route traffic control centers. They direct each plane's speed and altitude. 1901, descend and maintain 10,000. Join the Blue Ridge 010 radial and inbound. We have a good area there to go through. Captain Connors has some concerns about the route he's been given. He sees a storm cell along that path, and he doesn't want to fly through it. Well, I'm looking at a cell at about a heading of uh, 255. It's a pretty good sized cell. I'd rather not go through it. I'd rather go around it one way or the other. I've had about 60 aircraft go through this area out here, 10 to 12 miles wide. They're getting a good ride, no problem. Well, I can see a cell now about heading 240. When I can, I'll turn you into Blue Ridge. It'll be about the 010 radial. 010, Roger. We're going to hold you to that. Captain Connors gets his way. He's given permission to fly around the storm. Once past it, he'll line up for a landing on runway 17 left. I'm glad we didn't have to go through that. Friday afternoons are a busy time at airports. The afternoon rain is making this Friday even busier. 23-niner down to 61896. The main priority for the controller on duty is to keep the incoming planes a safe distance apart. He wants them at least four and a half kilometers from each other. That distance allows enough time for the violent air turbulence behind one plane to die down before the next plane touches down. Right now, Connors and Price are getting too close to the plane just ahead of them, a corporate Learjet. Delta 191 heavy, turn left 10 degrees, reduce speed to 180. To put some distance between the two planes, the controller asks the Delta crew to slow to 180 knots. Delta 191. 330 kilometers an hour. Wilco. 10 degree flaps, please. You're listening to Dallas 105 FM. It's a wet one out there, folks, so drive careful. Heading home along Highway 114, William Mabry will soon be passing DFW. Flight 191 is now just 50 kilometers from the foot of the runway. Ladies and gentlemen, we are starting our approach to DFW. Please make sure your seats are in the upright position and your seatbelts are securely fastened. The crew begins their final descent into the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Attention all aircraft listening. There's a little rain shower just north of the airport. Connors now switches radio frequencies and contacts a local DFW airport traffic controller for approach instructions. As the passengers and crew of Flight 191 prepare for their landing, a deadly force takes shape in their path. Critical decisions and missed information conspire against them. The crew will soon be engaged in a 47-second struggle which will become one of the most important moments in the history of modern aviation. August the 2nd, 1985. The crew of Delta Airlines Flight 191 has been skirting a line of heavy storms between Florida and their destination, Texas. 30 kilometers from the Dallas-Fort Worth airport, First Officer Rudy Price notices rain ahead. We're gonna get our airplane washed. What? We're going to get our airplane washed. It seemed like the closer we got into DFW, the worse the weather got. And we was turning it into the, the rain instead of going around it. And the pilots never said anything about the bad weather. Delta 191 is still closing in on the Learjet ahead of it. Price and Connors need to slow down even further to put some distance between the two planes. Delta 191 Heavy, reduce speed to 150. 
speed to 150. Nine kilometers from runway 17 left, Delta 191 is handed over to another controller, Gene Skipworth, for final approach and landing. Tower, Delta 191 Heavy, out here in the rain, feels good. Delta 191 Skipworth heavy. tells the crew to expect a manageable crosswind of up to 15 knots. Winds 090 at 5, gusts to 15. Thank you, sir. First Officer Price will be at the controls for the upcoming landing. Pilots and co pilots routinely alternate flying duties. As Flight 191 is coming into land, William Maybury is just north of the airport. He's caught in the same storm that Price and Connors are just beginning to fly through. Before landing check. Landing gear. Down, three green. Flaps, slats. 33, 33, green lights. The crew suddenly notices that they'll be flying into more than a bit of rain. It's lightning coming out of that one. What? There's lightning coming out of that one. Where? Right ahead of us. A thousand feet. I'll call them out to you. All right. We're not getting any bad warnings from the weather or from other pilots, which we rely on as they come through it. Uh, they they need to report to us, and they do if they have turbulence or they have trouble on final or ran into anything abnormal. The Learjet ahead of Flight 191 lands safely. Connors and Price are now less than a minute behind. Without warning, the intensity of the storm increases. The L-1011 is being pounded by a driving rain. I knew we was getting ready to land, but at the same time, you felt the surge, like the pilots was revving up the engine for something. The plane's airspeed is increasing for no apparent reason. Watch your speed. Price pulls back on the throttles to slow the plane down and maintain it at the requested 150 knots. The plane is just 180 meters from the ground. You're gonna lose it all of a sudden. There it is. Then the plane drops rapidly. <laughs> it's as though an invisible force is pushing it to the ground. Push it up. Push it way up. Way up. Way up. Way up. The crew is pushing the plane's jet engines to their full power, but can't get more speed or get the plane to climb. So I pulled my seatbelt tight as I could, but, but at the same time, you could hear a pin drop. Nobody was talking. But I mean, it got dead silence. As suddenly as it began, the crisis seems to end. The plane stops falling and begins to pick up some of the speed Connors and Price have been fighting for. <sighs> That's it. But before the crew can take another breath, the plane drops again, rocking violently from side to side. And then it dips wildly to the right. And I just knew we shouldn't be that close to the ground that soon. Hang on to the son of a... About two kilometers from the runway, it plows into a field and rockets towards Highway 114. When we hit the ground, it felt like you was in a car running over road road ties. It was real bumpy. The crew somehow manages to get the plane back in the air. At that moment, Gene Skipworth catches sight of Delta 191. He's gonna crash! Delta, go around! But it's too late. The plane's engines slam into William Maybury's car on Highway 114. He is killed instantly. The plane hits the ground again, north of the runway. It's traveling more than 350 kilometers an hour. I 
I must have caught sight of him just at the last millisecond, and he cartwheeled into the tank in just an instant, and then, of course, there was fire, not a ball of fire, but a wall of fire. It seemed like it was only a few seconds, five seconds at the most. I don't know how long it was. We was, everything was stopped. The resulting explosion is so powerful that the rear section of the plane is blasted backwards, away from the fireball. Then all of a sudden you look up and it's just nothing there. It's, everything's gone. You just see the whole big picture outside, like the plane just opened up. Remarkably, the tail section containing the last 10 rows of seats is relatively intact. People just thrown around on, on the ground. Some were clothes on, some without clothes on, some were burned. It was something that you can't describe unless you were there to see it. It, it is something that you will never get out of your mind. Hang in there, help someone. Then, as suddenly as it had started, the rain stops. It takes firefighters less than a minute to get to the crash. And when I arrived on the scene, I truly believe that there wasn't anybody that had survived this plane crash because there was just devastation everywhere. What I had pulled up on at the time was the, the wing section, which is the portion of the aircraft that carries the fuel. So there was a large amount of fuel and a large amount of flames. The front of the plane has all but disintegrated. I knew I had to get out there. At the time, I was a stringer for Time Magazine, worked with them on a part-time basis, called their Atlanta headquarters for this portion of the country. They said one word, go. Firefighters need only a few minutes to get the raging fire under control. They then turn their attention to pulling survivors from the plane. Uh, it wasn't until the fire started to subside a little bit that I saw the tail section where there was some hope of some people surviving. There were these two uh, women that were walking through Ladies. the smoke. Ladies, clear the area! Get out of the way, clear the area! And it kind of surprised me, so I knew that there was hope and that there were people out there. Only 27 people survived the crash. I had seen death before as a medic in Vietnam, but it had never been aimed at civilians and certainly not on a mass casualty situation and certainly not this suddenly. I could tell how bad it was. You could see and smell and feel the death. We felt like we did everything that we could, and we were just, you know, we we're just pleased that there were survivors. I was scheduled to sit on off seat 15A, and I told him that wouldn't be no good because that was a non-smoking section. I was a smoker, so I had to be in back. That probably saved my life. Captain Connors, First Officer Price, and Second Officer Nasik are killed. So are five other crew members and 128 passengers. IBM's Don Estridge and his wife are among the dead. In the tower, there was silence for probably one to two minutes, of the, except for just an occasional transmission. But basically, it's just quiet, and you just sit there stunned and wishing you could do anything to take it back.
This is a monumental crash. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board arrive at DFW, determined to find the cause. One of our field investigators would have been on scene trying to locate the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder, which is, uh, uh, you know, a very important part of the investigation. Investigators begin looking for evidence of mechanical failure. They examined the wreckage for clues that the plane was not responding to the pilot's command. It's essential in any approach or departure accident to establish what the airplane's configuration was, to, to assure that it was not a factor in the accident, where everything was normal on this aircraft. Investigators turn their attention away from the plane and to the skies. After any accident in commercial aviation, there are theories galore, a couple of them prevalent that evening. First, that lightning had struck the airplane. Secondly, that it had been hit by a mini tornado. Lightning coming out of that one. Where? Right ahead of us. 15 different witnesses, including flight crews, report seeing lightning as Flight 191 was descending towards the runway. The investigators have to consider the possibility that Flight 191 was hit by lightning. Lightning is always uh, something that, that you have to investigate to determine the, uh, the possibility that lightning disabled some part of the airplane. In 1963, a Boeing 707 was struck by lightning. The lightning ignited the fuel in the plane's tank. The plane crashed. 81 people died. There had been a handful of similar crashes since then. Key pieces of wreckage from Flight 191 are taken to the NTSB lab in Washington, D.C. Bud Lehner is the investigator in charge of examining the wreckage, as well as the data from the plane's cockpit voice recorder. But sometimes it might be very difficult to find to, to determine where the airplane might have been struck by lightning and where the exit point was. Lightning coming out of that one. Where? where? Right ahead of us. If the plane was hit by lightning, there would be evidence left behind. A device called a static discharge wick is attached to the trailing edge of an airplane's wings. It redirects static electricity into the outside air instead of into the plane where the charge could cause a fire. If the plane was hit by lightning, one of the pieces that would be visibly damaged is the static discharge wick. Nothing there. With lightning ruled out, investigators go looking elsewhere. They would soon discover the real culprit. It had actually been caught on tape. A Delta Airlines L-1011 crashes after entering a storm near Dallas. One hundred and thirty-seven people die. Investigators rule out mechanical problems and lightning as causes of the crash. Nothing there. The NTSB's Bud Lehner turns his attention to the plane just ahead of Delta 191, the corporate Learjet. He learns that it was less than a minute ahead and flew through the very same storm. After we had passed about five miles from the end of the runway, we entered a rain shower, what we thought was a light rain shower, and it turned out to be the heaviest rain I've ever seen before or since. In spite of the rain, Rufus Lewis managed to land his plane safely on runway 17 left. When we broke out of the clouds, we were high and hot. 
So we had to use all of the runway at DFW Airport. We landed, were able to turn off at the end of the runway. So why was the much larger L-1011 unable to land just moments later? Delta 191 Heavy, reduced speed to 15... To put some distance between Delta 191 and the Learjet, the controller had asked Price to slow his plane several times. When Lena plots the bigger plane's speed, then down to 150, he finds that it was coming in to land at 150 knots. Delta 191 Heavy, reduce speed to 150. Investigators consider the possibility that Flight 191 had been traveling too slowly for a safe landing. If you don't have a lot of extra energy, you don't have anything to trade in case you get in trouble. Uh, so uh, it's a lot of times in adverse conditions, the pilots, uh, they had uh, another 10 knots for mom and the kids. Crews don't have to follow a controller's speed request if they think it's unsafe. Price did reduce his speed. He knew this plane extremely well. He had actually helped to rewrite the L-1011's operating manual. If the captain decided that 150 knots was too slow, they would have told the controller it was too slow and they wouldn't have flown it. Lena consults the airplane's manufacturer and interviews other L-1011 pilots. He concludes that neither the controller nor First Officer Price made any errors regarding speed. Delta 191 Heavy, reduce speed to 150. This plane should have been able to land at 150 knots. Speed to 150. Bud Laner still doesn't know what slammed Flight 191 into the ground. But soon, he finds the clues he needs on the plane's flight data recorder. It logs every adjustment pilots make to the plane's controls. The device also records external elements like temperature, wind speed, altitude, and air pressure. Whatever Connors and Price were fighting, there's a good chance it left its fingerprints on the flight data recorder. This flight data recorder gave us several parameters we didn't have before. Engine power, uh, longitudinal acceleration and those kinds of parameters really enabled us to do a, a more in-depth analysis. The plane's data recorder has documented a combination of rapidly shifting winds. Then it shifts to a downdraft. In a matter of seconds, the plane was hit with strong winds from the front, then from above and then from behind. There you have it. For Bud Laner, that sequence could only mean one thing, a microburst. A microburst is a violent shaft of air falling from a storm cloud. Back in 1985, few people knew more about encounters between microbursts and airplanes than John McCarthy. If you're at the kitchen sink and you turn on the water and it goes straight down and it splashes out in all directions. And that's kind of what a microburst is except that it is extremely bad news if you're an airplane flying through it at low altitude. A plane first faces a strong headwind which lifts the plane skyward, then a downdraft which slams it towards the ground. Finally, the microburst delivers its most dangerous punch, the tailwind. And you would get a rapid descent, a loss of lift and a rapid descent towards the ground and easily crash the airplane. A plane's wings need a steady flow of air moving over them. That's what gives them their lift. By inhibiting that flow, the tailwind reduces lift. There's no better recipe for a microburst than the weather conditions at Dallas-Fort Worth on the day of the crash. It had been extremely hot all day, and hot air rises. When that hot air meets the cold, moist air in the storm clouds, it cools instantly and rushes violently back to Earth, a microburst. It is a tiny thing, meteorologically speaking, compared to a, a big storm or a snowstorm or a hurricane. It's just a, like a needle in a haystack. At its maximum strength, it's, it's no more than two miles across. And it lasts no more than 15 minutes. 
So if you look at that little space and time window, it's very small. And so the probability of hitting one is low. The odds may be slim, but planes do fly into microbursts. In 1975, an Eastern Airlines flight landing in New York flew into a microburst. It slammed the plane into the ground, killing 113 people. Then in 1982, a microburst killed another 153 people when it struck a Pan Am 727 taking off from New Orleans. It was clear that 136 people on flight 191 had become the latest victims of a microburst. Investigators had their culprit. Unbelievable. And thanks to flight 191's advanced data recorder, they could paint a remarkably accurate picture of it. The killer had essentially been caught on tape. But what the flight data recorder doesn't explain is how such an experienced crew fell victim to a killer they were all trained to overcome. When Lena compares the pilot's actions to the actions of the microburst, Watch your speed. he uncovers details of a fight to the death, a fight that the Delta pilots almost won. Lose it all of a sudden. There it is. He seemed to know what he was going to hit. Watch your speed. The increase in airspeed prompted First Officer Price to reduce power to his engines. Power that he would desperately need in just a few seconds. You're going to lose it all of a sudden. There it is. When Price and Connors entered the downdraft, push it up. They were less than 250 meters from the ground. The captain knew the characteristics of a microburst. He'd obviously been given an introduction to wind shear and microburst uh, characteristics in his flight training. When Connors and Price encountered the microburst's tailwind, there was very little they could do. They had insufficient speed and altitude with which to maneuver. If a pilot encounters a strong tailwind at 3,000 meters, he can point his nose down and dive to pick up speed and generate lift. It's called trading altitude for airspeed. But that trade wasn't available to Price and Connors. They were just 150 meters off the ground when the tailwind struck. The only way for them to gain airspeed was from their engines. Push it up. Way up. Co-pilot responds. The airplane stabilizes. I can see that most pilots would say, well, we're through with that, and it's going to, the rain's going to stop, we're going to land. Momentarily, their efforts seem to pay off. Their airspeed increases, their plunge is halted. But with Flight 191 less than 150 meters from the ground, this particular microburst delivered the ultimate blow. A fierce crosswind that forces their plane to bank dangerously to the right. Combined with the microburst's other winds, the crew was defenseless. Toga is takeoff go around mode. And uh, what it means to a pilot in that regime of flight is let's abandon the approach. We're no longer going to try to land this airplane. We want to do everything we can now to, to survive the, the wind condition that we've entered. The skill and experience of the pilots were no match for this microburst. It was too big, its winds too powerful and unpredictable. The entire fight lasted only 47 seconds. The pilots of Delta Flight 191 did their very best to recover from the situation, and it didn't work out. Investigators were left with one perplexing question. Why had Connors flown into the storm in the first place? Prior to 1985, the radars on board the aircraft were built to detect thunderstorms, uh, essentially heavy areas of precipitation. They were not effective. They were not even designed to detect the microburst. So those radars were essentially useless at low altitudes for looking at the microburst phenomena. Microbursts are invisible, but they generally emerge from storm clouds. That's why pilots are trained not to fly into storms if they see lightning. It's a pretty good sized cell, and I'd rather not go through it. I'd rather go around it one way or the other. When I can, I'll turn you into Blue Ridge. It'll be about 010 radial. 
Zero, one, zero. Oh, Roger. Captain Connors was not a risk taker. He was known as a cautious pilot. I'm glad we didn't have to go through that mess. It's hard to blame the air crew. Their job is to avoid thunderstorms, and there's probably a forecast for thunderstorms every day at Dallas in the summertime. Which ones do you avoid? And it's, you know, it's, it's a very difficult problem. Earlier in the flight, Connors had flown around bad weather. Investigators can only conclude that he underestimated the storm in his path at the foot of runway 17 left. When you're in a landing sequence at an airport like uh, Dallas or Atlanta or Chicago, and you see other airplanes ahead that are landing uneventfully, you might get the impression that there's a thunderstorm there, but I'm going to pass through it very quickly, and, and it's not going to be a factor for me. Airports like DFW have sophisticated systems in place to provide weather information to pilots. A thunderstorm at the end of a runway is the kind of threat they were designed to identify. But this deadly storm managed to foil those systems. As Flight 191 was approaching the airport, the weather at DFW was changing very quickly. Attention all aircraft listening. There's a little rain shower just north of the airport. Captain Connors heard that part of the message. But then he switched his radio frequency for his final landing instructions. The Delta crew never heard the last part of this message about weather ahead. There's a little bitty thunderstorm sitting right on the final. There was an observation two minutes before the accident that there was a wall of water at the threshold of the runway. It's been my contention that that information would have been very important to the flight crew. Radar readouts from the day of the crash indicate that the storm cell Connors and Price flew into grew out of nothing in a matter of minutes. This is two minutes before the accident. The readout shows the beginnings of a weather cell at the foot of runway 17 left. This is three minutes after the accident. We have a new cell right at the uh, threshold of the runway that uh, wasn't evident in the previous picture. This explains why Rufus Lewis was able to land his Learjet. The microburst was just beginning to form when he was approaching the runway. Many people think that there was a huge vertical development that the pilots recognized, and they just decided to go fly through it anyway. And uh, I maintain, and I think the evidence proves it, that uh, that was not the case. Uh, they didn't recognize this, this new developing cell. They did get into the storm beneath the cell, but it was heavy rain. They weren't worried about that. Then the hammer fell. It was too late. It's small. It's the length of a runway, roughly, and it doesn't last very long. So it's something that can happen so quickly that many accidents have occurred because nobody knew it was there. The storm arrived at the foot of runway 17 left virtually unannounced. But once there, it attracted a lot of attention. Pilots on the ground, as well as trained weather observers, saw the worsening storm. But they all saw it too late to warn the crew of Delta 191. The storm did show up on a radar screen at the Fort Worth Air Traffic Control Center. But at the time of the crash, the meteorologist on duty was in the cafeteria on a meal break. If the flight crew had had any idea that there would be a severe event in front of them, they would have missed the approach. Investigators conclude that the Delta crash was caused by the pilot's decision to continue their approach into the storm. A decision that was made because the crew wasn't warned about the hazard. In 1985, there were basic systems at airports that could detect dangerous winds, but they could not reliably detect a microburst. On the ground, there were systems called low-level wind shear alerting systems that primarily looked for differences of wind speed around the airport and on the airport. Unfortunately, these sensors tended to be spaced so far apart that a microburst could actually exist in between them and escape detection, or at least detection in time to warn a pilot of the threat. 
But a microburst detection system to overcome this problem had been developed. It was being tested in Denver and working very well. What we found out is that Doppler radar, which is on the ground, is incredibly effective in detecting microbursts. In fact, it can detect about 98% of a, of a microburst. Conventional radar uses radio waves to measure precipitation inside a storm. Doppler also sends out radio waves. But by measuring the frequency of returning waves, Doppler can also calculate the movement of the winds inside a storm. And if you look through the Doppler radar, you see a part of it that's going away from the radar and a part that's coming towards the radar. And if it's small, it's absolutely a microburst. It can be nothing else. So it has what we call an unambiguous signature of a microburst, which means we got it. Since Doppler radar could see a microburst, controllers could use it to warn crews of their presence. The Denver research resulted in an important new system at airports, Terminal Doppler Weather Radar. When the system detects dangerous conditions, it relays a warning to air traffic controllers, who can then alert pilots. Flight 236, microburst alert. Five zero nine five, one mile final, stay in tensions. After the crash of Delta 191, the Federal Aviation Authority, the FAA, hurried to install terminal Doppler weather radar at high-risk airports. Dallas-Fort Worth was one of the first. The domes containing the specialized radar are now a common fixture at major airports around the world. But radar on the ground can't get the warning to the pilots fast enough. We also have an issue of ground-based systems in that it takes time to communicate the threat to the crew. The system has to detect it on the ground. It would typically go to a control position in the control tower and be relayed by voice to the pilot, which can introduce a delay of 10, 15, 20 seconds, which could be very critical. Planes also needed onboard microburst detection. A team from NASA began developing such a system by flying into the most dangerous microbursts they could find. Zero. Here we go. Take it. Straight ahead. By risking their own lives, they would eventually save thousands of others. Delta Airlines Flight 191 is the latest in a string of crashes attributed to a microburst. Since 1964, microbursts were shown to be the cause of 26 accidents, claiming more than 500 lives. The public is unnerved. Politicians are demanding answers. The killer has to be stopped. The body count is building, and this cat, this particular crash, tipped the scales as far as the federal government was concerned. The crash of Delta 191 showed that seconds count when planes encounter a microburst. You're going to lose it all of a sudden. There it is. Increasing alert times. Push it up. Way could up. save more lives, especially if a microburst detector was mounted right on the plane. If you can provide the airplane with 10, 15, 20 seconds of advance warning, pilots push the throttles up, they build airspeed, they build altitude, they build energy. It's like money in the bank. By the time they get to the microburst during a recovery, they can survive. Aviation experts had to find a way to give all pilots those critical 20 seconds. To develop that technology, they would embark on a high-risk, unprecedented research project. They would fly a 737 into the most severe microbursts they could find. We did a very careful risk analysis of all the possible dangers that, that could occur. And initially, you know, the first reaction was, you want to do what with an airplane? You want to fly it through a microburst? In the summer of 1991, NASA modified a Boeing 737 and went hunting for microbursts. The idea was to identify onboard technology that could warn pilots of a microburst in their path. 
the airborne solution brings detection right into the cockpit. So the pilot sees exactly what's in front of the aircraft, and when an alert is given, there's no time delay. Ground speed 234. The NASA researchers were testing three separate systems for detecting microbursts. Modified Doppler radar housed in the 737's nose, a laser radar under its forward cargo bay, and a side-mounted infrared device to measure changes in air temperature. Each of those systems was wired to banks of computers in the plane's cabin. A spotter on the ground could find a microburst and quickly direct the plane towards it. Roger Control 515. We're rolling. Roger, understand your roll. TDWR, NASA Control. Range. Range, 45 miles. Ground speed, 240. Here we go. Take it. Straight ahead. Need, need to come left about uh, 10 degrees, 15 degrees. Well, when you spotted a microburst, it was all business. It was how do we get there, how do we get to the right altitude, the right airspeed, the right position, when to begin data collection. So people were quite busy during these flights. But yeah, it was exciting. We, we wanted to find them, we wanted to penetrate them. With every microburst, the three onboard detection systems were put to the test. Researchers on the plane could instantly see which instrument was doing the best job of picking up the microburst ahead. Behind the aft flight deck, we had pallets of equipment where the radar engineers, the laser engineers, and the data recording engineers could sit and ensure that each system was performing as, as expected. Ground speed two, three, four. Dead ahead, maybe one degree to the left. Let's go straight through this one. Here we go. Take it. Straight ahead. We started with very, very weak microburst. Again, we had the ground-based radar telling us what we were about to go into. So we started with very weak microburst, gained experience, then gradually worked up to stronger and stronger ones. You would see the rain begin to fall, and you would feel a sinking feeling. It would be a little settling, you know, a little like an elevator starting down. A few minutes here before we touch down, what do you see So any apprehension that the crew may have had initially about going through them was actually replaced later with joy at finding them. Here comes the center of the target right now. 242 on the ground speed. Wind's gone away. Look for a tailwind. Watch. Lost some altitude there, too. There, the wind's gone around the tail at 10 knots. Good, strong downdraft in the middle of it. Just sucked 100 feet in almost no time at all. Our good performance decreased, too. We were about 850, and we dropped to 750. Beautiful. The Langley researchers flew into dozens of microbursts over the course of their research. The project proved that the forward-looking Doppler radar was the only system that could consistently give pilots advanced warnings of a microburst ahead. What we found was that the Doppler radars could detect an extremely wide variety of microburst. Lightning coming out of that one. If the crew of Delta 191 had a system to warn them of microbursts, they could have boosted power to their engines and started climbing before they encountered it. That might have given them the speed and the altitude which they sorely lacked right. when they began their battle with the storm. The Langley flight tests had, in effect, tamed the microburst menace. After the NASA tests, the FAA certified a Doppler-based warning system for planes. Today, forward-looking Doppler radar is standard equipment on commercial flights around the world. The good news out of all of this tragedy is so many things have now happened from radar to ground-based systems to airborne systems and especially to training for pilots. We think that microburst accidents are a thing of the past. If there is one crash that we can look back on now and say, this made things safer because we learned from it. It was Delta 191. The changes made after the crash of Delta 191 have saved countless lives. Captain Connors and First Officer Price lost their fight against a microburst, but their struggle did manage to expose and disarm an invisible killer. <laughs>